Welcome back to part two of Real Estate Economics 2010 Recap. In section one, we discuss the national economy, uh, national employment, and some trends in labor costs, productivity, and wage levels. We'll transition here to a more specific look at the housing market, beginning here with 30-year fixed rate mortgages. If you've seen any of our past webinars on individual regions or MSAs, we deal with this quite frequently. Uh, these are annualized figures, so recognize that there might be slightly different figures on the ground as we're talking today. Uh, in either case, real estate um, rates have been in about a 30-year super cycle down. We believe we're coming to a transition period here uh, where rates have a very good chance of heading back in the other direction. Some of that trend has already been in place. If you watch 10-year notes, 30-year interest rates, uh, either on mortgages or U.S. Treasuries. Those rates have been in, been hitting up quite steeply the last few uh, weeks and months. This really is a two-edged sword. Higher mortgage interest rates will have two effects uh, immediately. One, it will make homes less affordable as ownership costs increase due to higher rates. It will also act to keep a lid on appreciation. If those homes become more expensive to own, particularly in this climate, uh, it's going to be very hard for them to appreciate at high levels. Now we have um, appreciation expectations in many, many markets because the market is severely overcorrected, but uh, higher rates will put a lid on that over time. Now let's look at income growth. We talked earlier in Section 1 about average hourly earnings and the labor surplus, labor oversupply. On a household basis, Incomes tend to rise almost through thick and thin, but what's happened here in the last few years is the rate of growth has become very, very low. We're quite concerned at this point about the continuation of the Bush era tax cuts. If we lose those uh, tax cuts and revert to the older, higher rates, that'll be immediate loss of take-home pay, which we think will cause a tremendous uproar and probably put a dent into our uh, weak economic recovery. You can see we've got an uptrend in household incomes over this forecast period, although the numbers are pretty, pretty soft. Let's look at uh, housing construction patterns. As you can see, during the boom years nationally, we've uh, built uh, as many as 1.8 million homes on an annualized number. We're now down under 400,000. I think the last month's new home sales annualized at a number that was far, far less, 250,000 if my memory serves. Um, on an annualized basis again, very, very low. That's not nearly enough um, uh, production to deal with units that are taken out of service due to conversion to other uses, units that are, have reached the end of their physical lives. The problem is just where these units are. We have many markets with far too many units. Uh, meanwhile, there is growth in other areas, so it becomes very, very localized. If you've seen our um, regional webinars, we often present the housing demand and supply. What we see here in green is the demand for housing. Again, that's driven uh, nearly entirely or, or certainly um, in terms of importance. Employment is extremely important in the demand for housing. During times when employment growth is very strong, the demand for housing can grow quite quickly. It will definitely outstrip supply, which tends to grow slowly under the best of conditions and grows uh, uh, nearly none at all, almost a flat line if you look at the current periods 2010, 2011, 2012, almost you know, near zero growth on a, on a historical perspective. But when the economy softens, as we see here in this particular graph in, in 2009, then the demand falls way off. So what we have now is, is by comparison, we have too many homes for the size of the labor force generally attributable to shrinkage in the labor force. So when there's too much supply of anything, not enough demand for it, we see price degradation. There are more sellers than buyers and prices tend to erode. So what we need to really repair this is improvement in employment that we think will take place uh, over the forecast period with a return to equilibrium about 2013, 2014. We've already got many markets that are performing better. At the same time, there's markets that are going to be weak for years to come. We can put a number on this yeah, in terms of overbuilt and underbuilt. Again, we think we're um, 
overbuilt during a period when the jobs are poor, such as now. Uh, so that's below the zero line, below the red line on the, on the bottom half of the scale. We think that uh, overbuilt condition runs out to about 6 million units at this point in time. We've been underbuilt by almost the same number when employment was very good. We really need improving employment and improving sentiment, improving economic fundamentals to have our employment base build back into the size of our housing stock. Let's talk about valuation. Normally, valuation um, price and supportable price tend to track quite well because people have to qualify for loans. It was only during the subprime debacle that that relationship became uncoupled. People could suddenly get a loan much larger than their income could support. The only way for that to manifest itself is into house price. So what do we see? We see house prices take off you know, way in advance or, or really disconnect from the economic fundamentals and prices rise very quickly. Uh, we've all known how that ended. That's not ended well and that uh, adjustment period continues to this day. So what we've got is uh, lower prices, you know, since 2009 and through the forecast period. Now if you notice the green supportable home price is above the forecast home price. People could afford a more expensive home today than they, uh, than the median price would uh, seem to indicate based on current incomes and interest rates. Now why aren't they doing that? Because poor sentiment, poor employment conditions, uh, poor, ec poor economic background, people don't want to go out and commit. But rates, rates are low, incomes are steady, and so homes are generally very, very affordable. Uh, we've seen people, rental investors, that sort of type, uh, they're already on top of this. They're out going through these markets, looking for the best homes in the best places, buying those and putting those, locking down those low ownership costs. Here we can see that in another overvalued, undervalued uh, situation. The market got very overvalued below the line during subprime and has become very undervalued based on a comparison of incomes in the country and national interest rates. So what's that do to home prices? We saw the big bubble associated with the subprime, the overvaluation, when the household incomes and mortgage lending disconnected. We're still paying that back, and we won't achieve a full payback during the forecast period. We're bound to slightly or get a bit of mean reversion here over the next few years. Uh, people will begin to recognize that homes are undervalued, that there's a lot of good homes and good schools and good locations out there. They will start to pick those up. Early adopters will get the best deals. Uh, you can buy a historically um, underpriced home with artificially low rates today and lock down uh, your ownership costs for years to come. It just takes a little bit better economics and sentiment for people to recognize that. This particular graph shows median home prices. You can see the degradation that took place during the subprime area, minus era, minus 3.4%, minus 9, minus 10 on a national basis. But we've got some you know, low levels of price improvement uh, beginning in 2011. We've already seen that in the resale data in many markets across the country. Uh, some markets are showing a few less foreclosure sales and more conventional equity resales. That change in mix tends to, sh to result in higher average prices. Uh, some coastal areas are improving, some high demand, high employment areas are improving, but still there's uh, some troubled areas as we all know. Let's look at housing supply and demand patterns. Again, this relates to jobs. You can see in the data on the left hand side when the job numbers start to drop off, uh, the housing demand drops off at the same time. So when the economy weakens, we can quickly go from a market that is characterized as being overbuilt on the right side of the table, or underbuilt, I should say, to overbuilt. When we lose those jobs, uh, initially there's not enough homes and the market's underbuilt, but when we lose those jobs, the market can quickly become overbuilt. Now we're not going to get rid of those homes, so we're going to have to grow the employment back into the size of the housing stock, as we've mentioned here today. That will take time, but gradually as the employment base fills out again, those homes will fill up and will return to a condition closer to equilibrium uh, 2013, the end of 2014, and some markets will be far ahead of others. 
On the valuation side, you can see here what we talked about ownership costs here. When interest rates at the center of this table are very, very low, the annual mortgage cost drops tremendously. So you take that median household income in whatever area and it's taking a smaller portion of that income to own the home. The ownership costs are very, very low and that home is, by historical standards, tremendously undervalued. We see that in many, many markets across the country today. The everyday median household income at today's rates can afford more home than they're buying. It's sentiment, it's poor economics that are keeping them from recognizing that. Over time that will change. Also over time the rates are going to go up and make that home a little uh, more expensive to own. And that's why it's if you've got good, good job prospects and you think you can stay employed, um, the the opportunity to buy a home and lock down very, very low ownership costs is here today and for the next couple of years. So what does this all translate into? We believe that the housing prices in many, many markets and on a national basis are overcorrected. The prices are too low because of our job losses, um, artificially low interest rates, and this uh, situation of overcorrected prices combined to offer years or buyers years of low ownership costs. Um, you can lock those down now and have those for the entire life of the mortgage if you play your uh, cards correctly. Federal Reserve policy has made capital cheap. Now that uh, is good for buyers and prospective homeowners. We believe a, a better approach in our economic environment would have made would have been to make labor cheaper. We should have um, done more on the labor side, and that would have ultimately helped us out on the uh, overall uh, collective economic side. We think going forward, younger buyers are going to take a different approach to housing. Uh, we believe a lot of younger buyers, the college graduates of today, are going to prefer to remain mobile. Um, they're going to look not just nationally, but internationally for the employment markets that they want to be in going forward. Uh, they're probably going to form households later and settle down later, and that's going to affect the housing market demographics over the next decade. At the same time, mature buyers are going to do the same thing. We saw the era where buyers wanted golf courses and views and this sort of thing. We think the mature buyer of the future is going to look at state fiscal and financial conditions, what states have managed their money, what states are going to be able to sustain their uh, programs and support their services, what states are going to have good roads and have you know, uh, secure, healthy police departments, that sort of thing. That's going to take on a greater focus than it has in the past. Uh, gradually, and we're seeing this already, international demand is coming into a number of markets. People around the world are taking the opportunity to buy a house in the U.S., uh, you know, often for only part-time occupancy, uh, just because the values are so low. That and gradual economic improvement is, is going to help prices over time. This economic disruption has uh, made a lot of winners and losers, and it's making winners and losers in terms of industries. You can think of the industries that have come and gone, uh, national economies, countries going up and down, housing markets are going up and down. Recovery is going to favor those uh, states with good policies, those cities with good policies, those industries that are up and coming and not favor uh, the opposite. So watch those areas, watch those trends. That'll show you the important markets to be in in the next decade. One of the things we do here at Housing uh, Real Estate Economics is our housing transactions report. Across the country, you can drill down to a neighborhood. You can look at condos, attached, detached, uh, any sort of a zip code, any sort of geography, a master plan. You can search the data, sort out the recent sales. It's really the basis for a tremendous amount of the consulting work we do here. And check our website. These are coverage areas that, uh, that we're trying to expand all the time. Uh, we're happy to help you uh, use this and work with this if you're not familiar with it. Uh, we do residential economic reports. This is our major coverage areas. If you have an area of interest that you like, that you don't see, we're really capable of, of creating these for almost any place that you're interested in. Uh, give us a week or ten days and let us know what area you'd like to see and we'll see if we can create one for you.
If any of you know Mark, uh, I put my contact information here. I'm John Mulville, Senior Vice President of Consulting. Call me if you have any questions about what we've discussed today or any other topics of interest. Thank you for joining us and be sure and join us next week.